All right, so uh, why don't we get started? Um, I work at Vox uh, Media, um, and this talk is mostly going to be about like understanding the customer and kind of what that means. And I'm going to talk about it through the lens of a media company, but I think that this could be applied across like any industry, any company. Um, the idea is to kind of like unlock your data that's otherwise trashed in lots of different databases. Um, just a quick uh, overview of uh, Vox Media. Vox Media owns like a bunch of uh, web properties that are all digital. And you know, depending on what you read on the internet, you may have run into a few of these. Uh, personally, I read SB Nation, like Cal Golden Blogs, and um, Eater the most. But you know, we may have different preferences. So just to quickly go over what we'll do, we'll talk about like why you would want to do this, um, how you would structure such a database, assuming you want to do it, and then how you would start using it. So we get started. Um, so basically, like, one of the main things that you always talk about whenever you're talking about data science, like, why would you do data science? Um, you know, and a lot of talks that we've heard today, they're sort of all about, um, you know, don't just start doing data science because you think you're going to uncover stuff. Um, you know, ask yourself, like, what are the questions you really want to answer? So in our case, like, you know, we want to know our audience. If you think about a media company, we, I always think of it as a triangle. We, we're trying to, our audience are the people who come and read the articles. We have journalists and writers who write the articles, and then we have our advertisers who want to engage with our audience that wants to read the articles. And because there's no uh, paywall or anything like that, our site is funded by the advertising dollars. So that triangle is um, worth understanding, and you know we're always trying to ask like what kind of like business decisions are we trying to drive? How can we increase engagement? Like what does it mean to be loyal at our website? Um, so we're just trying to understand a lot of things about our audience. We also may want to understand stuff about our actual articles, like you know, all the articles that are getting written. And we may want to understand about our advertising and how they connect to it. Um, so here's a perfectly good example. Um, lots of companies do this. You have like a weekly newsletter, and you're using it to drive audience engagement. And you know, how do you know how much it's helping? Right? So you can, of course, like depending on what email program you use, we use something called Campaign Monitor, but there's other things in the world like SendGrid and, I don't know, Bronto, we use that, yeah, an old company. Um, you know, you can look at your click-through rates and you can look at, um, you know, open rates and all that kind of stuff and be impressed how amazing your newsletter is. But, you know, what I want to know when I'm thinking about audience analysis, and that is, is that how do I know that the person who subscribes to the newsletter do they spend, are they two times as many page views than a person who doesn't get the newsletter? Because that would be good. What if it was only, you know, 1.1 times as many page views and it spent, and we spent a ton of time and effort, you know, doing these newsletters? Well, that wouldn't be good. Maybe we shouldn't do newsletters. On the other hand, what if it was 10x page views for someone who subscribes to newsletters? We should be like paying people to sign up for the newsletter, right? So, you know, these are the kind of questions that you really want to know. But are the answers that you really, really want to know and the questions you're trying to ask. But um, how to get those answers from the data that you have is not always the easiest thing to do. Um, so I will talk a little bit about like some of the bottlenecks, um, and we'll go through like these um, individually um, in the next uh, couple slides. Um, so the first thing we'll talk about is like the fact that your data is literally all over the place, right? Whether it's in a relational database, whether it's in Google Analytics. Um, whether it's, you know, for us, our clickstream data for our website is all in Google Analytics and gets dumped into BigQuery. Um, you know, then we have our newsletter subscriptions are all in this thing called Campaign Monitor. And then we have a custom in-house database to track, like, when people are logged in. So, you know, these are all, like, various different sources. And even if we had, like, a magical data lake and all this kind of stuff, like, things are still, like, in very disparate areas. And I've kind of given up on this notion of like, oh, let's just have all the data in one place, and that will be like amazing. Because no matter what you do, um, there's always going to be another data set. There's always going to be some API you have to deal with. Somebody's going to literally email you a CSV file with 10 billion rows. You know, so um, you can't. I've kind of given up on that. So what instead I'm trying to do is like kind of build a, like a summary database, the one that you can really use to answer your questions. So that's what we're going to get into next. OK, so relational databases are also a pain. Um, you know, I don't know if people were used to use like Microsoft Access or something like that way back when. Um, you know, it was a good idea because you, know, you were trying to save space, right? Space was a real premium. You didn't want to repeat any information. But nowadays, like, space is relatively cheap and free for, them, for that matter. So 
you know, just having to get your information across doing all these different joins, like one table to another, like one is just a lot of overhead for a data scientist. Two, it's kind of hard to like remember it all. And two, it's, and the third thing is you can make mistakes, right? You can like get weird cross products of joins if you're not doing it right, nothing really matches up. So we're trying to get to the point where we can kind of flatten this relational database. Um, all right, so like let's try thinking about like answering a question from our relational database, right? So on average, what's the time between like first and second purchase? And maybe we could also ask a secondary question like, well, what's the time between you know, your first purchase and when you registered on the website? Something like that. Um, so if I was to do it the old fashioned way, um, so here's just a little bit of like pseudo SQL code. And these aren't even like real tables, I just kind of made them up. I just assume that you have an orders table with an order date, right? So if I'm gonna do this, I first have to like, for each individual user, I have to figure out their first order date by doing this group by and this min. Um, I'm pretty sure the syntax is right. I mean, I didn't test it, because I didn't actually have this table. But, you know, so you get the idea that your first query is gonna be get the person's first purchase date or first order date. And then you have to join it back to the originals order table. So now you have your order date and your first order date, and then you subtract them, and then hopefully the they match up for the very first purchase. The day's difference should be zero. So the one where you know it's not zero should be your second order, assuming there is one for you. You would rank the orders by the user. You would filter on the second order, and then you would take the average. And then, assuming you want to do it for registration and you have like a customers table, you would have to join to that table as well to get sort of like this registration info as well. So this is what I consider like to be a relatively repeatable pattern. You're doing this all the time. But it's just the hassle. And you know, every single um, time you're doing it, you're just sort of faced with the same problem. So wouldn't it be nice if you had this amazing new customers table in your database, and you could literally like do something very simple. And you know, where you could just like say, okay, you know, day since first order is greater than zero, so that means it's like your second order. And you take the minimum of that, and you just quickly get the average of the number of days. And so this is like what I'm considering like the ideal state uh, to help answer questions quickly. And then you could, of course, like answer different questions like how, many, how much time between second and third order, and um, how much is your second order on average more than your first order, any types of like business questions like that, because you might be trying to figure out like, oh, like, you know, they made their first order, and I want to encourage them to make the second order, and um, what can I do to decrease that time? Something like that. These are like real business questions. You might change something on your website. You might have an email marketing campaign. You might do any number of like real business things with this information. Um, all right, so let's do like kind of like a real example. Um, I was on Kaggle the other day. There was this thing called um, uh, Data for Good, some kind of competition. So Donors Choose is a website. I don't know how familiar people are with the teaching world. Teachers like ask for money for like funding for things. It's sort of like crowdsource. Um, a way for them to raise funds so they can get more laptops or more, more materials or whatever it is a teacher is trying to do in their school. And they found that like a lot of people are one-time donors, but they don't make their second donation. So what can they, what can like this Kaggle competition do to kind of help you uh, figure out how to reduce that or increase the number, reduce the time for the second donation or um, increase the number of second-time donors. Um, so this is just like the snapshot of what uh, it looks like on the Kaggle website. Um, this is what the data looks like. So this is not even a relational database. It's just basically the orders table came in through like a CSV file. And you know you might recognize this as like a printout of like a pandas you know print uh, data frame. So you have an ID, you have a donation amount, you have a timestamp. Um, okay, so this is just like the raw data, and um, you know it's a data science conference, so there's some Python here. Um, and we don't have to go through all of this, but you know, you get the idea that I, sort of what I talked about before, like this part kind of like figures out the, your first purchase date, and then you merge it back with the original data, and then you uh, do a bunch of group by and rank to figure out which was your first, second, third purchase, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this actually works because I printed it out into another data frame. And so now this is my, what I'm calling my new amazing customer table which is where instead of um, each particular line with no information, I have like this additional column that I created called days since first purchase, right? And so now I can like, and then I can also have like, um, I didn't show it here, but there's a, 
purchase rank column as well, one, two, three, four. And then what you can do is like in Python, just filter on the second one and take the average. And then you would get the number of days till your second purchase. So this is what I think like, this is done in like a Python environment. But of course, like once you've tested it out, make sure you're happy with your Python environment, you might consider taking this whole data frame and pushing it up to an actual database where you can like query it and use it for other stuff. So that's what the sort of like structuring part of the database we'll get to in a second. All right, so then uh, what other kind of bottlenecks we have? So I don't know how many other people use Google Analytics at their company. Web stuff is trapped in there. There's an amazing amount of data in there, right? Um, this is like just one record, right? One article that Ezra Klein wrote. He's like our main editor-in-chief at Box. Um, and it's just like, it's a lot of data, but it's in this like nested structure. And it's like hard to get information out of Google Analytics. Um, and then there's this like notion of like a custom dimension in Google Analytics. And if it was bad enough before to try to figure out from a, just a regular relational database any useful information, try doing it in Google Analytics. Like I don't even understand what this syntax is really. I mean I do, but why it has to be this way to get the author of an article and you know filter again on that down here. Like I get a headache every time. I have to do a query on Google Analytics data. And I kind of mess it up and I kind of get it wrong. I have to cut and paste from like a previous query just so I have like this template of how to deal with, um, you know, just to find out like the number of page views for like a particular article that Ezra Klein wrote. So um, this is just like, you know, just another bottleneck and another thing that's like preventing you from getting to the numbers that you really want. Um, and so what are the challenges, you know, some of the particular challenges with Google Analytics or any of these databases that have like this kind of nested record structure, which seems like an innovation to like, you know, hold more and more data, but in fact makes it harder for you to extract stuff out. So Google Analytics in particular switched from legacy to standard SQL recently. Um, some things work in one, some things work in the other. Um, it's hard to aggregate across multiple, that was just one cu must custom dimension. If you had multiple custom dimensions you wanted to query across, you know, sometimes it breaks, sometimes it doesn't work. It's hard to group by a custom dimension without doing like multiple nested queries. So it's really just like a lot of effort um, for a data scientist. And look, you do it because you have to, but ideally when you're trying to answer these business questions and you really just want to know tell me which articles Ezra Klein wrote and what are the page views on average, this is not the kind of hassle I want to go through to get to those numbers. Um, so now we're going to talk about, given that we want a better solution, like how would we structure this kind of like what I'm calling an audience database? And really like I'm calling it a database because it's going to be in like some kind of like SQL server or um, any whatever your favorite um, SQL variant is, but it's really like essentially like one table. And um, you could also have like multiple tables as you like build up this audience database. But um, really like we'll consider it a table for now. So look at the table architecture and then some of the tools that you might use to uh, get there. Um, so first of all, I, I like to just keep stuff pretty simple. Um, identify like the key, like kind of, kind of the unique key that you have. So in our case, it's either a Google visitor ID for an audience thing, or if we're looking at articles, like an article has like a unique key in our database. So whatever it is, the key thing you want to track. And then you want to have a line for like every time segment. So let's say you want to track daily page views. So I would say for every article um, and every day, I would want one entry, assuming that that article got you. Or for like people, audience, like every day that a particular person comes back, I want to track the number of sessions and page views that they generated. Um, so then the next thing is, is that um, identify the things you want to analyze or keep track of, such as page views, sessions, logins, newsletters, whatever. And then also like the extra useful info. And, and this sounds like a throwaway line, but this is actually like the important part because um, you're going to want to segment your data by various um, I don't know, various fields. So for example, I have like nine, nine networks at Box, right? I have Curbed, I have Eater, I have SB Nation. Within SB Nation, there's like 250 like individual team blogs. So I want to be able to say like, oh, um, you know, 
this is what's going on with page views just in Eater. And so, or I want to be able to compare, like, what are page views on Eater like compared to SB Nation or Vox or something like that. So I'm going to throw in extra useful information uh, because um, it's going to help me segment the data better. Um, and then one thing to kind of keep in mind is that, like, in the relational database situation, you're, you're not wanting to repeat information, right? You're wanting to be frugal with your information. You want If you can look something up using a join, you usually do that in a relational database. In this world, you actually want to get away from that model. You don't want to waste time doing joins. You want to put this like extra stuff in there. So I'll show an example of that in a second. But it's OK, because like since these things are generally columnar data stores, um, if you're not querying on that column, you're not really wasting a lot of time. Um, it's not messing up your um, you know, your, the expense or the time it takes. So it's kind of okay to have like redundant data in these kind of like tables. So here's an example of what I was trying to do. This is what I'm, for our articles, you know, there's a bunch of like timing. Um, here's like a bunch of IDs for my article. Um, there's like actually three of them. I have them all. Um, this is like the network, whether you're Vox or Eater or Curved, um, you know, and then uh, there's just like some redundant like title, like, um, I don't necessarily need that to do my joins, but like, it's hard for me to understand. Like, and I can go look that up somewhere else. But it's just nice to have it there when I'm like looking at the thing and seeing if my model is making sense or not. And but the actual number I'm just tracking. This is like the single number that I'm tracking. It's like page views for all these other fields put together. And then I'm gonna. And this is the derived field, the days since publish. This is the thing that like my Python is gonna like do before I shove it into this table. And then this is sort of like what you know, just a snapshot of what the data might look like. I mean, and you can see here, like, even though I could look up with the identifier what network you belong to, I've like just put in the network. And then also we have a notion of like a community ID. So depending on like at SB Nation, um, you know, there's the flagship brand, but at SB Nation there's also like Cal Golden Blogs. So there's like individual sub-communities within the network. And even though I could go look all that stuff up, I would rather just like have all that information here so that if I want to do some segmentation or filtering, all of the information is all in one table. So it doesn't take me so long. All right, so then, and how do you get to, um, so once you've like decided on your table architecture and you decided you want to have this table, um, you want to make it easy for yourself. You, um, you want a, a good, nice, repeatable process. Um, um, Airflow is this tool. Um, it's uh, I think it was originally developed by Airbnb. It's like a data pipelining tool, um, and it kind of automates the process of backfilling and updating data. There's some other tools out there as well that are like similar-ish, but this is the one that we use uh, to kind of uh, help us with our uh, updating and backfilling. So the cool thing about something like Airflow is that you have like a pretty familiar Python scripting environment, so you can do all your data massaging, all your columns, and all your features that you want. And you know you can put them into like these things called DAGs, so that you can set them up to run at a particular time every day. They can be dependent on other you know, extractions or data loads before that. And the cool thing about something like this is that it's repeatable. Um, Airflow gives you a way to like trace like if anything broke, or that way you're not like running cron scripts and looking at logs all the time. Um, it's flexible. I mean, there's a bunch of different languages you can use around it. Um, it's easily extensible um, to a wide variety of data. Like, let's say some of your data is coming from through an API. Some of your other data is coming from your BigQuery or Google Analytics. All, no matter where your data is coming from, you can kind of like attach to all of it. And then this is what I would say is like in these DAGs, this is where you do the dirty stuff. This is where you do code up that nasty Google Analytics query, but you kind of put it in this step so that you don't have to keep like doing it over and over again every time that you want to uh, you know, get to that data that's going to give you insights quickly. All right, so I'm doing OK on time. All right, so um, I think I might even be going a little bit fast. Um, all right, so let's talk about using this audience database. Um, so now that we've um, got some ideas that we want to build this audience database, like some of the things that you might want to just kind of keep in mind is you know to keep it like simple and flexible. Um, for example, like you might consider it'd be really great to have for a user that's coming back to the site over and over again. You might want to have a number in there called the overall visit number. Is it your first number? Is it your first time? Second time? Third time? Fourth time? 
Um, and so sometimes you do want this and sometimes you don't. So, but we could just talk about quickly um, some advantages and disadvantages of, of doing that, right? So the advantage is if you have that visit number in there, you can very quickly just do like some averaging or filtering on that visit number, right? You can say like, what's the time between first and second visit? Or what's the difference? Um, you know, as you visit more, do you, um, do you generate more and more page views? On the other hand, if you think about like, you know, it's one thing if you're given a really large data set and like you put it all in at once. But you can imagine that, you know, your page views are happening on a daily basis and you need to update your data, this audience database, every day. So as new data comes in for the next day, you have to say like, well, this visitor has like another 10 page views. So, but if I have this field called the overall visit number, I have to know like, okay, well, I have to go back to the database and say, well, you know, the last time this person visited, it was his 17th visit. And so now I have to figure out this is the 18th visit. And I have to have some logic to increment that, you know, overall visit number and put it in to the database. So, um, you know, you could imagine that like that would be like a lot of work and a, a lot of kind of like overhead. Whereas you could just, like if you go back to the original idea of um, this thing here, um, if you just have the publish um, time or the publish date and the, you know, the item and the page views, you could just keep track of it almost like a time series database. And so I think a, a lot of this, um, this kind of notion of a time series database gets used a lot in finance as well, right? Because you can imagine you have like a universe, of like 500 S&P stocks, and you want to just like analyze them every day, and there's like a new price and a new stock ticker and a new entry in your database every day. Um, all right, so you do want to like try to keep it as simple as possible and try to keep it flexible, but you know, there are times when you might need to um, you know, have this overall visit number. But then again, like if it's like a dirty piece of work that you have to do and do a lookup, you know, you do it, want to do it in that step where you're doing your, um, your Airflow, your DAG, your Python scripting to kind of like put it all together. All right, so another thing that um, is worth mentioning is that um, this kind of audience database, it's definitely gonna like save you time and your organization time in like so many ways. And so one of the things that I've found, because this is the second company where I've like tried to implement uh, something like this, and that is, is like, even before you start, um, you know, talk it up, like, you know, tell people like, hey, this takes really long time to do these uh, Google Analytics queries, or, um, you know, wouldn't it be like you're trying to ask this question about, um, you know, customers and the time between the first and second order, and wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if like an analyst could do that? And so you want to be able to kind of like talk about its impending value before you even build it. Um, or at least that's what I like to do. Um, and then once you do build it, um, you'll see that like it will give your data savvy analysts, the ones that might have some SQL skills, um, they'll have like basically like new su superpowers. Like they will be able to, if they can't do like those Google Analytics queries with custom dimensions and stuff <coughs> like that, they will still with this new data set be able to like extract like kind of business level insights very very quickly as well as you know like come up with like new ideas poke around um, and try to figure out like you know new stuff and then also now that your data scientists are not spending all this time doing that um, they will actually you will be able to free them up with more time to like kind of do the stuff that you probably originally hired them and paid them to do um, and then the other thing like I didn't really put a line in here for is, you know, we haven't really talked about like machine learning models or, you know, churn analysis or some of these like more interesting things that you imagine that your data scientists would want to do. Like this kind of a data set also puts you like right on the brink of being able to do that, right? Because in order, you know, we all know that like, you know, any of these machine learning models, like it's completely dependent on like the feature engineering and like, you know, like reorienting your data, figuring out what your feature column should be. And you're, once you have this audience database, you are like right at the brink of being able to try to figure out like, you know, what you should do to kind of like start to model audience behavior. Because, you know, if you're still back at that step where you have like, you know, stuff in custom dimensions and Google Analytics, you would, you would have like a long uh, way to go to get to those like machine learning models. And so you could also keep that in mind as you're building 
up this audience database. Like, think about like, okay, you have some ideas of like some kind of modeling you want to do. Like, go ahead and think about what are the kind of fields that you would want to track and what kind of metrics you would want to track in order to like make that happen. And then the other thing is, um, you know, the data engineers that you have, they should help in maintaining these like pipelines and DAGs. Data scientists can definitely help like put the stuff together, and then they can like kind of architect like the Python part of it, like doing the part where.